KPTZ, in conjunction with the Port Townsend Public Library, is pleased to present an interview with Pam Houston, author of this year's Community Read selection, Contents May Have Shifted. I'm Chris Wilson, Adult Services Librarian and Coordinator of the 2013 Community Read. The annual Community Read began in 2006 when Library Director Teresa Percy brought the idea of having a Community Read to Port Townsend. Throughout the entire month of March, the library will have book discussions and events tied to the themes of the book and designed for all ages. All events are free and funded by grants from Humanities Washington and our own Friends of the Library. Our goal is to continue to have more people enjoy reading and have fun with their neighbors. The Community Read Month always concludes with an appearance by the author at the Port Townsend High School. As part of the program, and to encourage the book to be read by as many people as possible, the library has 30 copies of the book in circulation for our library patrons and copies available for sale at a discounted price of $10. We also distributed 100 free copies of the book to our patrons. In lieu of our monthly scheduled programs, in conversation with Sheila Bender and the Book Lovers Cafe, we are pleased to present an interview with Pam Houston, author of this year's Community Read book selection, Contents May Have Shifted. Our interviewer is Sheila Bender. Hello, I'm Sheila Bender, and it is my pleasure to be here today at our KPTZ Studios, 91.9 FM, Port Townsend, Washington. I'll be speaking with Pam Houston. Pam is the author of the book we'll be using as our community read, and previous to that, two collections of short stories, Cowboys Are My Weakness and Walsing the Cat, the novel Sighthound, and a collection of essays called A Little More About Me. They were all published by W. W. Norton. Her stories have been selected for volumes of Best American Short Stories, the O'Henry Awards, Pushcart Prize, and Best American Short Stories of the Century. She is the winner of the Western States Book Award, the Willa Award for Contemporary Fiction, and the Evil Companions Literary Award, as well as multiple teaching awards. She is currently the Director of Creative Writing at the University of California, Davis, and teaches in the Pacific University Low Residency MFA program, and at writers' conferences, including our own centrums around the country and around the world. She lives on a ranch in Colorado near the headwaters of the Rio Grande. Pam, thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure. I understand that you're talking to us from Juneau, Alaska. Yes, I'm in Juneau at the moment. Let's turn to talking about your novel. I know that our readers here in Port Townsend are busy reading it. Our library is busy handing out copies. It's very exciting to see copies of the book around town and to hear the buzz about what we're going to be privy to, which culminates in your coming to visit and read to us from your book. There's so much to say about your book. There's so much in it. There are so many friends, so many lovers, so many places in the world so many adventures. But I'd like to begin by asking you the question that I know most people are asking about the book and are asking you about it. It is a novel. Your other books have been labeled short stories, memoir. I'm wondering if you can talk to us about your choice here to use this material in the form of a novel and maybe say something a little bit about the structure of this book. Okay. Well, it's, it's interesting that you said my choice you know, to, to, to how to use the material, because that's exactly how I approach material. You know, my process as a writer, I, I try to follow Henry James' advice, which is to strive to be a person on whom nothing is lost. And so my writing always begins not in my imagination, but in my observation of the world. And so what I really think my process is as a writer is to collect what I call these glimmers, these moments out in the world that have some sort of resonance. And that can be a very simple thing, like the way the light's coming through the trees, or we woke up this morning and it was just clear enough to see some of these magnificent peaks around here with lots of fresh snow on them. Or it can be really complicated, like watching my mother's ashes get put into the ground or the opportunity I had to go to a Tibetan sky burial. You know, it, 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 it can be a big moment, a big life-changing or ending moment, or it can be just the, just the tiniest thing, a, a bird song overheard or a conversation overheard in a checkout line. 
But all of my work is about collecting those things and bringing them to the page and trying to render them in really as precise detail as I can and then putting them next to other things that also had resonance for me and seeing what they add up to together. And in and that's how I've written all my books, essentially. But in the past, I have then shaped them with a real eye to logic and chronology and, you know, tried to make stories out of them, out of all these individual pieces. And in this book, I thought, what if I just left them discreet from each other and didn't try so hard to stretch them like taffy into something that is recognizable as a traditional short story or essay? You know, what if I just let them sit next to each other and let the reader enter in between them and make the connections? Now, that is not to say that I didn't order them, you know, with a great deal of care so that they would both seem random but also add up to a novel, you know, if, if a novel in pieces. So, so that was, that was the, the way the book got made. It's made of 144 tiny adventures, you know, some of them as short as one sentence long, and the longest one, I think, is three pages. And they are organized, again, to appear like a random selection, but in fact, I think, Pam, the narrator, <laughs> makes a certain kind of progress and grows throughout the novel, and there is a kind of narrative arc to I the book to, as a whole. I have to say, Pam, I totally agree yeah. <laughs> that, that that is, you know, the earmark of a novel is that the protagonist has a change, and yeah. from that and change And it was grows. interesting, because when I was first writing the book, and I was really committed to this form, I was afraid that, you know, I, I would write for three years, and it would add up to nothing. You know, I would have a lot, I would have 144 nice little pieces of nothing, you know, that didn't add up to anything. So what I told myself in those early days of writing was, oh, it's okay. No one ever really makes real progress. All progress in life is <laughs> illusory and we never really learn and grow. So I told myself all these kind of nihilistic things so that I wouldn't psych myself out basically. And but you then, know, it's funny, Pam, is I'm thinking maybe that's why we write novels because yeah. in life it doesn't happen, but in our novels right. it can. <laughs> right. Then, you know, once I got a certain way in and I felt, okay, I've got something. I, this, is, this is something. You know, I've got it. Then I was more inclined to let what I think of as that sleeping dragon of narrative art kind of rise up. And I started to organize a little more with Pam's progress in mind, you know, at that mm-hmm. point. Somewhere in the book, you say that the character Pam asked her editor if she could call the character Pam. Mm-hmm. I think that's in the book as opposed to no, your, an no, author it's statement. It's probably yeah. in the uh, reader guide. Right. That's where it is. Yeah. Because it's, yeah. it's actually you, the author, asking and being very relieved when she said, yes, Pam was a good name. My question is as reader and as, as a writer talking with you is, could you have easily made the decision to do a memoir in this form? And why was it your choice, as I said, to make it a novel? Well, when I actually asked my editor, we had gone back and forth about whether we were going to call her Pam or Melanie. Those were the two <laughs> choices. And Mel, actually, you uh-huh. know, because I like those short androgynous names. And I, what, I, what happened is I called her and I said, should I just give up this whole wanting to call her Pam thing? Should I just call her Melanie and be done with it? Because, you know, the lawyer was involved in that conversation and there was a lot of, like, is this going to mean the book is going to be marginalized because it's neither here nor there? You know, I said, should I just give up and call her Melanie? Should we just call her Mel? And what Elaine Mason, my editor, said was, is no, let's call her Pam because we want them to think it's Pam and it's not Pam. And that was really critical to the decision and also to, to my relationship with my editor because this is the first book I've done with her and, and I, I knew that she really understood my project. And, mm-hmm. and that's the thing about me. I mean, all my books have existed in this kind of gray area between fiction and nonfiction. They are all, generally speaking, autobiographical, but generally speaking, I have taken liberties with the truth. And so they are often usually called fiction. And, and when I say taken liberties with the truth, I don't mean that I've claimed to have done things I haven't or that I pretend that I went to t- a Tibetan sky burial. I, I did all those things. Those are my experiences. But when I was in grad school, 
the choices were fiction and poetry. You, you know, if your lines went all the way to the end of the page, you were a fiction writer. Right. <laughs> and if your lines didn't go to the end of the page, you were a poet. And there wasn't memoir, and there wasn't creative nonfiction. I mean, there was. There was In Cold Blood, and there was In Patagonia, and a couple of other books, but nothing like what there is now. And so for me, the project has always been, as I said, paying really close attention out in the world, bringing it to the page, and then shaping it into story. And that shaping sometimes means that a whole day gets left out of a river trip, or a character isn't really a lawyer, he's a carpenter. You know, Uh like those sorts of changes can happen in service of the story. And for me, I'm in service of the story, more so than I am in representing any kind of reality. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're more comfortable calling it, or not even more comfortable, it enriches you as a writer to be writing this as fiction. I think that's a good way to say it. I mean, to be honest, I wasn't sure what we were going to call it, you know, for a long time. I just wrote it. I just wrote my experience down and shaped it, which in some cases meant altering it, you know. Mm -hmm. And, And if... Norton had, if my publisher had come along and said, you know, let's call this a memoir, it's close enough to you, and memoirs are what's selling, well, then I would have had to go back in, you know, and, and, and correct uh-huh. some of those <laughs> changes and put them back to how it really was. But that's not really the writer I have been, although I'm, I'm about to start writing an actual memoir that is actually going to attempt to actually adhere to what really happened. But that's going to be that's just not the kind of writer I have been, uh-huh. you know. So for me it's just more interesting to have the freedom to shape. Mm-hmm. It's it's not a matter of protecting myself, it's not a matter of, you know, needing the story to be bigger. It's really none of those things. It's just about the freedom to add the line of dialogue that maybe should have been said but wasn't or move a story from one locale to another if the locale isn't absolutely critical. You know, it, mm-hmm. it, it's just about having that freedom to, to shape and change and make it a more kind of viable art object, not to be grand about it, but, you know, to, to, make, it, to make it prettier, to make it more shapely uh-huh. often. I think that's a well-said description of what a novelist is doing. So I think yeah. that to write memoir is going to be an interesting shift for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is KPTZ, 91.9 FM, Port Townsend. If you've just joined us, you are listening to an interview with Pam Houston, author of Contents May Have Shifted, the book selection for our 2013 community read. Pam is being interviewed by Sheila Bender. Um, when you mentioned the fear you had that you would have a whole lot of, I think you said a whole lot of nothing and not a book. Mm -hmm. from these pieces, it struck me that I needed to tell you, even if it hadn't culminated as this novel, there's no way that this would have been a whole lot of nothing. Um, Because there's such a, there are many venues now, of course, publishing sudden nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And I even see poems arising. I'm talking particularly about, I don't know if you have your book in front of you, but page 195, where you're remembering being, or you, Pam, I mean, it's hard to speak with you without (laughs) saying that, where the Pam in the book is yeah. saying that she was a park ranger at Nat- Natural Bridges National Monument, and mm-hmm. they would get packages there, small mm-hmm. packages, frequently from people who had illegally picked up pot shards and right. felt that they needed to return them to the right place. And not only that they would send the packages, but they would send maps of where, hand-drawn right. maps of where they had found it, and, and that the Pam in the book would put these pieces back as close as she could figure from their maps to where they had come from. So that one passage, if it were broken out into lines Mm -hmm. that didn't reach the margins, I really Mm -hmm. believe would have been a poem. Well, I'll tell you the truth. You know, poetry is my true love, Mm -hmm. you know, as as a reader. I, I adore poetry, and I've learned so much from poets. And in my grad program at the University of Utah, the poet, it was Larry Levison, Mark Strand, and, uh-huh. you know, how could you do better than right. that? And I didn't, I was too afraid to take classes from them because I was too convinced that I'm not a poet. But in many ways, this book is my ode to the poets. You know, it's my sort of ode to my lo- my own love, my lifelong love of poetry, and the fact that I read more poetry probably than I read anything mm-hmm. or have over the years, you know. 
so for me, the way this book is made, the associative relationships between the pieces, rather than, as I said, logical or necessarily chronological relationship between the pieces, the, the, the fact that the book's founded on associative connection is really my way of saying, I'm not a poet, but I love <laughs> poetry. And, and also the compression in the book. I mean, another thing that I really worked on, and this is part of the way, honestly, that it deviates from the events as they actually happened, is compression of language was very important to me in this book. You know, I wanted these scenes to be rendered in, in the fewest words possible that I could use and still achieve their richness. And mm-hmm. so, so there was a lot of tamping down and removing words. And I did a thing at the end of the book, at, I mean, at the end of the writing process, where in my Microsoft Word document, Anytime there was a widow, you know, anytime there was a, line, a couple words that went over a line or anytime there was a line of a section that went over to another page, I just played a game where I forced myself to pull it up, where I forced myself to take a few more words out so uh-huh. that those widows would disappear. And, of course, that had no bearing on the final manuscript because it was going to be typeset in a font that wasn't mine. You know, it was just simply an exercise where... I could say to myself, okay, what if your life depended on taking three words out of this paragraph? How, how, would you make it, how would you make it tighter? And so I did a lot of that with this book, which also seems in a certain way like a poet's task. You know, it was, it was me making the language work as hard as I knew how to make it. I love that. I, I love having you say that to listeners. I know as, as a writing teacher, when I show people what will happen if they take out exposition or they take out extra words or how the words start to resonate much more deeply without the surrounding language, they will often, new writers, miss those words that are taken out, miss them so much that they can't really allow themselves to feel the difference. And it's it's just, it's an interesting thing. Uh, There are words I hear in my head from early poems that I wrote that editors took a few words out of. I still hear those words when I read that poem. Right. And I wonder, right. did you miss any of your words when you took them out? No. In fact, I, I mean, and this is, you know, five books in, I'm, I'm, I'm the opposite of a young writer. Right. <laughs> I'm an old writer. Um, so it goes away, and, the missing. <laughs> so, no. I mean, in fact, I would go so far as to say I, I took 17 pages out of a 280-page ma- manuscript by playing that game, two or three words at a time. Mm-hmm. And I feel probably way too strongly about how much better the book is for the absence of those words. It's sort of the opposite. I feel like, oh, I'm so glad I took those words out. And that's, you know, that's a lot about my training, but it's also a lot about, like you said, reading not only student work, but a lot of books that are being published. I mean, on the one hand, it's a really exciting time for publishing, and there's so many great books that are coming out. But there are also so many books where I think to myself, this book could have been so good if someone had just taken right. 10,000 words out of it. You know, it, it seems like often an otherwise really great book is just, it's just fat. And I think that's because <laughs> editors, you know, don't, don't spend their time editing so much anymore. Partly. Maybe some of the writers, I, I wonder sometimes with a famous writer, whether the editors are afraid <laughs> to tell mm-hmm. a very mm-hmm. established maybe. writer. Maybe. But you do say, the Pam in the book says yep. about having gone to a Robert Haas reading, that she is thinking about how the older we get, the more we're, I'm I'm quoting now, the more we're inclined Mm -hmm. to simply name the things of the world. A whole valley that smells of grapes fermenting in oaken barrels, the taste of donut holes dipped in coffee-flavored creme anglaise, a great blue heron standing on one foot at the rippling edge of a pond. Mm -hmm. And that spoke to me so much about what you're saying now, too, that The things we notice, if we name them, hold the resonance, the poetry of the moment. And I see you doing that throughout the book. I think that what we do as people and is not trust that sometimes, that we have to make something more of it than just the fact that it is what we remember. It is what spoke to us. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I I do think... For me, you know, one of the the great joys of writing has always been 
just getting to name things on the page, getting to speak their names. The Mendenhall Glacier, I happen to be two miles from at the Uh moment. What a beautiful set of words, the Mendenhall Glacier. Now, it's probably not enough to say Mendenhall Glacier. (laughs) I probably (laughs) need to walk over to the Mendenhall Glacier when we get off the phone and come back and describe the ice. And beyond that, if I'm lucky, a little something will happen at the Mendenhall <laughs> Glacier that will attach itself to the Mendenhall Glacier and make it, you know, make it one of those glimmers. But to me, it all starts with that concrete thing in the world. And for me, a lot of it's the natural world, but not exclusively, you know, not mm-hmm. exclusively. So as you saw in the book, we were talking today, Greg Glazner, my sweetheart, and I were talking about our favorite birds, and my favorite bird is a kingfisher, and his favorite bird is a a crow or or a raven. We're surrounded by ravens here, and we've been together for seven years. We know each other really well, but it was such a great talk to be able to say raven, raven, kingfisher, (laughs) kingfisher, you know, the whole way home. And and that's a lot of what I'm doing in my work, is just naming those things. Uh That is the collecting part that you talked about, I think, early in our conversation. You collect the images, and The fact that you collect them informs the writing, but there's this other part that comes with the way these collections of words come together with the inner emotions of the character and her own journey in life that is very stirring. And before we end our conversation, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the paranormal aspects of the life of Pam in the book. Not that she's paranormal, but there is a lot of attention among her friends and her own activities, to energy work, to, in one case, a child who can see the ghosts of, of people departed. Well, even more than that. And, I, I'm, and so some of the vignettes take place in Sedona mm-hmm. or at Canyon Ranch with energy work. And there's always a lesson, it seems to me, to be drawn from those encounters that Pam in the book is having. And I just felt very much like the book is of our times. These are the mm-hmm. kinds of activities mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. especially women are involved in. But I wondered if you wanted to say anything about that aspect of the Pam in the book's life. Absolutely. Well, the Pam in the book and out of the book uh, has a lot of back pain. And <laughs> as a result, Pam is in pursuit of, of help for that, which is where it started. You know, that's where it started for Pam in the book and, 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 for, and for me. But I also think in a bigger way, you know, this is, this is the moment. We are possibly the first, you know, faithless generation. I, I grew up really without religion. We went to church on Christmas Eve. You know, I think a lot of my friends grew up without religion. And this is the first time that's happened, you know, in, in our culture. And, and so for me, a lot of my life has been in pursuit of things to believe in and that gets really complicated because we all know, you know, sort of how just downright silly the New Age can be at certain times. But on the other hand, I think we've all met people, especially if we live in places like Port Townsend and Creed, Colorado, and, you know, we, we've met a lot of people who are very powerful and who are very gifted as healers in non-traditional ways. And, I mean, I wouldn't be upright without them. So for me, exploring that world and the way you know, this idea of kind of creating your own faith, small small f, your own faith, your own uh, belief system as a way to negotiate the world, as a way to try to be a bigger, broader, better person is one of the real advantages of not having been brought up in a religion that you have to either get over, you know, mm-hmm. or believe. And so so that's a lot of what this book is about. And in a certain way, it, it, my other books have been about that too. You know, it's about this kind of, okay, but what, so I want to be better. I want to be better, but who am I being better for? And and what does that mean? You know, what does that mean broadly in the world? And so, yes, that that this book is very concerned with that. And in 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 the world I live in, it is often the massage therapists and the acupuncturists who who are the most, you know, tuned in to any sort of meta real experience. Mm-hmm. It is definitely an enriching part of the book and I think many of us have have been awed by body workers' ability sure. to read us. Or 
And this might not be this might be the other side of that aspect of the book, but one of my very favorite moments in the book is when the character says the whole point of an earthquake is to ride it out. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I've been in earthquakes and thought, this is the earth and I have to just be here. But I love the twist of taking the whole big earth and all of its geological activity and saying the whole point of it is to ride it out. The planet has to ride it out. Mm -hmm. If we're in the earthquake zone, we ride it out. But of course, life is like that too. And all the upsets. I don't know exactly how to make the connection between the need to ride it out and the need for the healing help. But I think those are connected and a very wonderful thread that comes together, two threads that come together in your book. Well, thanks. And it's it's a sobering book and it's a book full of laughter as well. And I have to say that by the end, both the Pam in the book, and I feel like when I say Pam in the book and the Pam in real life, I'm also saying sort of imitating what you have with Fenton the dog and Fenton the human Mm -hmm, because you have two characters in there, the dog and the human with the same name. I feel like when I when I say those things, the, the Pam in the book and, and the Pam in real life, not being able really to sort them out, as I shouldn't be able to because you were the creator of the novel with the character named Pam, that I walk away feeling enriched and gratified to be alive and with a renewed interest in naming my the things in my environment and noticing those moments when either someone outside of me says something remarkable that has great synchronicity with where I am at the moment internally, or when something arrives from the inside, like for this Pam, the whole point of an earthquake is to write it out. Mm-hmm. I think your book is a study for, for many of us in how to trust what you're mm-hmm. calling the glimmers. It's very fortifying. Well, that's lovely, everything you just said, because that is, you described almost exactly, really, my experience of being alive, and that is the experience that I'm trying to capture in this book. So I, quite honestly, couldn't ask for a better <laughs> reader than you, because that's, that's, exactly what I'm, that's exactly what I'm after. Well, I think here in Port Townsend, you're going to have a lot of readers like this. And I just wanted to let you know, before we leave our conversation, that the kinds of activities surrounding the reading of your book this coming March here range from having local actors read from your book to a panel of therapists talking about different kinds of therapies to writers in town discussing their experience with writing in the genre of memoir and, and fiction to just dis- book discussion groups that are led by readers in town. So it's going to be quite a lot of experience among the people reading the book, experiencing your book in the ways that it touches their lives and the lives of others. And then you'll be here on March That's 28th. Cool. And we're all looking forward to your discussion. It says that you'll be answering questions and discussing the book. I'm sure you'll be doing a little bit of reading from it. Yep, that's right. Okay, well, thank you, Pam. I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Juneau. And I hope something happens at the glacier that you can collect (laughs) with the name. (laughs) Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sheila, for your care and attention to the bark. Thank you. Thanks again. All right, right. bye-bye. Bye. You have just heard Pam Houston, author of Contents May Have Shifted, our 2013 Community Read Selection, interviewed by Sheila Bender. You may check out or purchase a copy of this book from the Port Townsend Library, and we encourage you to attend all the free events planned during the month of March. For more information, go to the library website or pick up a brochure at the library at Mountain View Commons. This program was recorded at the KPDZ Studios in conjunction with the Port Townsend Public Library's Community Read Month. Sound and editing, Sheila Kaloff. Producer, Chris Wilson. Executive producer, Larry Stein. This is Chris Wilson. Thank you for listening. The breaking and the breathing.